Well, India, uh, in many ways, is a country whose biggest strengths are also its biggest weaknesses. Our diversity is enormous. There is no country on earth that I think embraces quite the range of uh, topographical features, climatic features, geography, ethnicity, religion, race, culture, language, all of these differences uh, in one political entity, the Union of India. Uh, we have something like um, uh, 10, 20,000 dialects spoken in our country, 23 languages officially recognized by the constitution. We are home to every religion known to mankind, with the possible exception of Shintoism, but even that I think had some ancient Hindu influences. Uh, we have um, uh, got probably every ethnic group known to mankind has mixed its blood in our, in our soil. So it's an extraordinarily diverse land. And yet in a modern political democracy, we have managed to establish the principle that a country can overcome differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, costume and custom, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is on the basic principle that in a rich and diverse democracy like India, you don't need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. And so the, the great success of India in managing this diversity through democracy uh, is the, the, the great story of Indian pluralism. And in my, in, my way, in my view, it is the one thing that we can truly celebrate about the Indian democratic experiment over the last six and a half decades. Now, if you look at the weaknesses, the same diversity can sometimes be a weakness. Pulling uh, such a vast and diverse set of people together for common objectives. We are not the world's most efficient country. When I think of uh, a country like Denmark, my own instinct is to assume that um, uh, we could learn a great deal from your sense of public order, civic duty, a sense of social responsibility across the board. Uh, you are of course, a much more homogeneous, homogeneous people. Uh, you, you have, most of you follow the same faith, have the same ethnicity, the same appearance, speak the same language. Uh, it's changing as is changing across Europe uh, and it's changing in Denmark as well. But it is arguably true that 90% of you, if not more, look alike, worship the same God uh, in the same language and, and uh, have the same sort of customs and cultural assumptions. We have nothing like that in India. Uh, and so, while we cannot ever be Denmark, we could learn a little bit, it seems to me, from the certain uh, orderliness of, of uh, Danish organization. The other aspect that uh, intrigues me about the, the whole Nordic model is the extraordinary strength of the welfare state. The fact that these are capitalist societies, people work and create wealth and run major companies, but at the same time, they've had a very strong conscience about the unfortunates in society and the safety net is extensive. In our country we don't have that. In our country uh, most Indians uh, have, to, um, have to manage on what they can do th for themselves or their family members and relatives can help them do. And the result is that we still have in our country large section of very poor people living uh, below a poverty line that has been drawn barely this side of the funeral pile. So it is, it, is, it is a much bigger challenge for us and how we can organize ourselves better as a society to take care better of the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us. That I think remains our biggest challenge. Uh, which has tended to follow the, the herd as it were with some of the sensationalist reporting of recent years. And I think that we, we do need to find out whether we can't have better journalism. And when we speak of better regulated journalism, we're really speaking of better journalism, just higher standards, more emphasis on fact-checking, on objectivity, on not confusing uh, opinion, commentary, speculation, and reporting all in one farrago, as often happens these days. So I have led two lives. I have um, uh, been uh, a professional at the United Nations, uh, worked for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, which I joined in 1978 under the old Danish Prime Minister, Paul Hartling, who became a friend. Uh, served uh, in UNHCR for many years, then moved to peacekeeping at the UN, uh, was the officer responsible for handling uh, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations responsibilities uh, on the Yugoslav Civil War, so I traveled there many times, spent many years uh, in, in peacekeeping, and then worked with uh, Kofi Annan when he became Secretary General, ending up as Under Secretary General myself at the United Nations. So a 29-year career 
working on the global stage, but in a wide variety of functions, humanitarian, uh, political, uh, peacekeeping and military work, as well as, of course, the management of the UN and ultimately the projection of the UN's message and image uh, through my work uh, as Under Secretary General. So all of that uh, was, for me, an extremely rewarding experience. But throughout that time, I was not content with doing always only that. I would try and carve out the time on evenings and weekends to write. I have published a dozen books. My 13th book, Pax Indica, uh, India and the World of the 21st Century, comes out in July of 2012. And now that I'm an elected member of parliament in India, I find my sh perspective has shifted much more to the domestic needs of my own country and my own, own people, uh, to whom I'm daily accountable as an elected member of parliament. And this combination of being anchored in the real world, of real people and their problems, and at the same time <coughs> trying to describe my own thoughts, reactions and ideas through my writing, that combination or that contradiction is what defines me.